Hi, everybody. This is Jay Halfon from the Higher Education Administration Program at Boston University's Wheelock College, um, where I teach and where our guest teaches as well. And uh, pleased to welcome you to this series, which is uh, primarily for the higher education students, but for others perhaps as well. Um, Daryl Halia is um, probably one of the most uh, established members of our faculty, certainly our, our veteran as well as our most versatile member as far as the courses that he's taught over a significant number of years. I'll give Daryl a chance to introduce himself and his background. But it's a chance for us to get to know him better and to um, better appreciate some of the issues and opportunities that he's faced in his career. Um, this being the end of the second month of our lockdown, um, I keep wanting to refer to it as a lock up, but it's, it's, um, it, it, it's probably driving us all a little bit crazy, but Daryl's very much on the front line at Boston University and can share some of the experiences there. But first I wanna ask Daryl a question that I've asked of others, but in his case, I think it's gonna be especially intriguing. Um, what was your original career objective? And um, tell us about your start when you were a student and what your expectations for your profession would be at that stage. Or perhaps I should say your calling. Oh, that's a great question. I haven't even, I haven't thought about my initial career track in a long, long time. So um, gosh, you know, I, I think when I went into college, I think I was initially fiddling with maybe one of two ideas. One was, um, and again, this was just kind of an exploratory stage. One was to perhaps go into things like pharmacy or business. Um, which were two kind of professional schools that my institution had. But another one, I, I was just initially thinking about going into the ministry. And um, I had some, some foundational work um, in high school in working with a local church. And I think one of the things that was on my mind was going into what could possibly have been the full-time uh, ministerial type of position and going to college. And so I majored in religion and philosophy. And um, that eventually tracked and made, brought me up to Boston to study theology um, for my master's degree as well. So that was probably my initial career track. And what, sidetracked. Yeah, what led you to sort of go secular and go residential when it, when it <laughs> came to higher education? What, what happened to, to affect that? <laughs> what you know, I think of grace did you experience? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of things happened. So I think, um, you know, like so many people change their major a, a gazillion times. I think study after study is showing that. Um, I, I was the first in my family to go to college. So I didn't really have a clear idea in my mind what I wanted to do. I don't think my parents did either. Um, but for me, when I went off to college, I really, uh, I fell in love with the idea of university life, the totality of it. And yeah, everything that I studied was, was fascinating and interesting and, and all these aha moments were going off. But it was more than that. It was being able to discuss what I was experiencing in class with my roommates back in the residence hall, where we, we would talk about the allegory of Plato's cave, for instance, late into the, into the night. Um, or at the same time, you know, playing um, club sports and, and uh, on, on the field um, in between classes, um, talking about life, uh, both inside and outside the classroom, in the dining hall, mm -hmm. in the library, um, and all those, those experiences that, that made up both in the classroom and outside the classroom were profoundly formative and life transforming. Mm -hmm. And I fell in love with all of it, the, the all encompassing world of mm -hmm. college life. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I think that's what kind of helped me to, to eventually sidestep out of say, working for a, a religious organization fundamentally. And, and instead really trying to step into a career that was fully and wholly dedicated to continuing to promulgate the type of collegiate experiences that I had. Yeah. Um, and at, at part, you know, I think that, that initially manifested itself in the possibility of getting a doctorate and teaching in the classroom. That was perhaps one of the most concrete forms. Mm -hmm. But the longer you spend in academia, you realize that there's multiple functional areas out there. And so it, it kind of spawned into this, this idea of um, first working within the student affairs world mm -hmm. uh, for about 15 something years. And all at the same time, trying to keep another leg into the academic affairs world, particularly in teaching and research and scholarship. Right. Yeah. And uh, that's how things kind of evolved after a while. And during those 15 years, were you living residentially on campus? I was. So I think with the exception of one year, one year in between undergrad and my graduate program, I've been, I was living on campus in a residence hall for 22 years, I think. 
And um, so at Boston University in a professional capacity, I was living and managing residence halls for 15 years directly. Um, my wife moved in with me after we got married. A couple years after that, we had kids in the residence halls at Miles Standish Hall in Boston University. And, okay. and we'd ride up into the elevators and they were the center of attention and we never hurt for babysitters. Mm. And they still have very positive memories of, of their experience. And, and um, I think they, hopefully that'll make its way into an admissions, uh, admissions essay one day where they can say they, they literally were born in, in a college uh, university residence hall. So, uh, so you're sort of a kibbutz approach to, uh, to, up, to, to upbringing, I think. It was, <laughs> yeah. It was, it, was, it was a very special that's, time. That's fascinating. And, and so eventually you, you moved off campus. But, but um, you, so, so you were focused very much on the holistic aspect of the student experience. Um, what, did you ex what did you experience in the residence halls that taught you about higher education and made you appreciate it more as a subject area? Yeah, that's a good question. I think, um, you know, I, I'm still developing thoughts on that today as I try to tease it all out. But I, I think what was clear is that even if you talk to students today and if you, if you ask them to, to reflect on their undergraduate experience, you know, assuming they went to a residential college, for instance, you know, what were some of the most meaningful experiences for them? Right. Um, for better or worse, they rarely point to that particular lecture in that particular class okay. or even that lab experience. What they point to are these often out of the classroom, extracurricular, sometimes co-curricular experiences that they found fundamentally life transforming. Mm. Um, and I think that, that awareness or observation was, was critical. Um, there's no doubt that students are getting, in many instances, very, very robust education through the coursework that they're taking. Right. But um, the people that they're interacting with outside the classroom, which can indeed include faculty, mm. uh, but also include student affairs administrators, but also their peers, uh, their student peers, are profoundly influential. And these contribute substantially to the memories that they take with them once they graduate. And I think they really contribute to their growth and maturation of young adults um, and even non-traditional um, students as well that are experiencing and having these interactions outside the classroom. They really do have both a, both a, a profound um, impact on students. And, and this has been shown in a number of empirical studies as well. Which may, of course, now be at risk to some extent. When you went through the litany of things that matter to you, the dining hall, the library, the athletic field, um, they all sound like they may be violating social distance, but um, yeah. going forward. So, so certainly, I think the, the, we, we need to find ways of, of recreating that holistic experience, even if we can't do it um, face to face. Right. It, it, it's so critical. It's so critical to, to what, we, what we envision as a college, uh, as a university. Um, it, there's, a, there's a long structured history behind why we exist that way. And when it's all of a sudden swept out from underneath your feet, you really miss it. Yeah. And, and it, the university is doing everything they can and, and all across the nation to try to get back to it. Right. And we'll get to that a little bit more. I'm, I'm fascinated with your fascination with Boston University. Um, you were a student here. You, you studied Boston University as part of your dissertation. You've taught at Boston University. You've lived at Boston University. Um, your ongoing scholarship is on Boston University. You're, you've developed a course on it. Um, you, you probably know more about the institution than probably any, any single living soul. So um, first of all, why, why that interest? Um, and, 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 and what, what precipitated that? And, and then of course, I'll ask you what you learned from it and you can yeah, tell sure. us the secrets of it. Well, I resisted it for some time. So it, it's funny. I remember when I was, um, pursuing my master's degree. So my first degree here at Boston university, yeah. um, a couple of years into it, I remember the Dean of the school of theology at that time gave me a copy of a 1950 edition of a book written by Daniel L. Marsh, who was the fourth president of Boston University. And I remember looking at it thinking, what is this? And I just immediately flipped it over and it, was, it went to the, the dustbin on my shelves. And I just didn't have an appreciation for the um, historical context of BU at that point in time. Yeah. Now, I, I mentioned that because years later, I would actually write my dissertation on Daniel Marsh, who authored that book. But uh, it, it, it came down to when I was working at, at uh, a residence hall on campus known as Miles Standish Hall, which had kind of a historical, it was, it's a historical piece of real estate. Yeah. Um, it was built in the mid-1920s. 
and it uh, was first established as kind of a prominent uh, hotel in the city of Boston. Um, and the only uh, downside to it is that by the time it really was really built, the Great Depression happened, and to it, so it kind of it, it kind of lost its luster and was never really able to to gain it. Although it, it it did have some reputation at the time. So I fell in love with simply by living in Miles Standish Hall and being surrounded by the history, literally of the architecture and the walls and and, and the design of that building, just developing an affinity and an attraction for it. And so I would dig little by little into trying to get a little bit more information about, about why, what that was, that building was all about and, and what it meant to students over the years. Um, and every once in a while, you, you uncover a bit of a, an anecdote or a story or, or a, a historical piece of artifact or material that would really just brighten your day. And you'd find out that Martin Luther King Jr. lived in Miles Standish Hall. And not only that, he met his, uh, his one day wife, Car Coretta, um, in, the, in the hall as well. That's Babe Ruth lived in the hall. And then all these various stories that, that contributed to students' experiences in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, fascinating stories mm. that uh, influenced their life and their memories mm. was bound in that one place. Yeah. And so it's, it's that kind of, that germ of that interest in history um, kind of spr um, sprung me into my eventual historical research that I did in focusing on Boston University when I was working for my doctoral program. Mm. And what have you learned about its its um, pr its journey through through the late you know nineteenth century through the through the twentieth century that's maybe been you know um, especially interesting maybe maybe different maybe unique um, did, did, um, did it simply follow the course that every other major urban research university followed or were there a few unique paths that it took along the way. It, it did in many ways. There's many parallels with other modern research universities that, that were kind of born or restructured at the turn of the 20th century. Yeah. What's unique about Boston University, though, is that being chartered in 1869, it was arguably, because of its, its first president, William Fairfield Warren, it was arguably, at that point in time, before Stanford, uh, before the University of Chicago, before John Hopkins, it was arguably the very first modern research university of its kind, in terms of its structure, having graduate schools and various professional schools and a college of, 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 of arts and sciences and a graduate school of arts and sciences. And that's how William Fairfield Warren, its first president, envisioned it. Mm -hmm. um, but I think because of some, some monetary losses early in its history, it did, not, it did not evolve as quickly as, say, John Hopkins did, even though John Hopkins uh, was, was founded a few years after, after 1869. Mm -hmm. so, it, it had that credit, but also since it was founded by abolitionists, Methodists, and these prominent Boston yeah. businessmen at the time, yeah. um, it was intentionally designed to offer an education that was accessible to all people, regardless of race, class, gender, or creed. So it began progressive in that it sense. It began progressive in that sense. And um, not every Methodist institution that was founded in that period of time has that same type of history, even though it was established within roughly about a 10 to 15 year period of other institutions. But the founders wanted Boston University to, to have that particular type of a mission. And so it was arguably the very first co-educational institution, modern university um, of its kind as well at that point in time. And this, this tracked and, and developing a reputation that attracted a number of students that had long been marginalized by institutions of higher education for centuries to Boston University to study, particularly at the School of Theology, but also other institutions. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, you hear these days in particular about particularly Ivy League institutions that have a really difficult um, tension-filled past, right. and particularly its relation to slavery, for instance. Yes. BU has something that is qualitatively different than that. Mm. And I think a number, and BU is, is, has a history of, of, of a number of, of, of checkered periods as well, but BU stands out. Uh, because of the original mission of its founders. Mm -hmm. And I think it stands out in a very positive relief compared to other institutions. That's fascinating. Um, well, it, in the sense of, in terms of national prominence, as you, as you mentioned a few times, Johns Hopkins is a school we think of as the major, um, um, uh, the major origins of, 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 a, of an urban research university. Was Boston University underachieving through much of its history? Um, and and, it, and, and certainly in terms of maybe national renown, it, it was, but in other respects, was it as well? Was it sort of a sleepy giant until a certain you know, um, strong autocratic president uh, appeared in the scenes? 
That's right. Yeah, that's a good point. So in many ways, it, it, it was a sleeping giant, but not, not because of um, lack of ambition. And I think um, when Boston University was originally founded, one of its founders, Isaac Rich, uh, be, left a bequest of $1.5 million to the university. And it was perhaps, it, it immediately propelled Boston University into being one of the most heavily endowed institutions in the country. So they had all these high aspirations, this wonderful mission, wonderful leadership, supportive founders, a, a, a pretty robust and strong endowment. But because of the Great Boston Fire of 1872, um, the Isaac Rich would bequest, which was locked away in real estate assets in downtown Boston, literally went up in flames overnight. Yeah. Okay. And the university was left with only about one fifth of its financial holdings after that fire. Wow. And for about 100 years after that, the university struggled financially. So despite its ambitions to be perhaps overachieving and to meet its goals, it lacked the, both the, it lacked the, really the financial footing to take that next step. And it would take almost 100 years or more to get to that point. Yeah. Um, but they had that ambition throughout. And yeah. they really tried, tried to pursue that. But it also, I mean, BU was growing up in a city that was literally in the shadows of the oldest and perhaps most prestigious institution in the nation, and that's Harvard. And so with Harvard on one side of the river, MIT on the other side of the river as well, BU was also ha always had this kind of, uh, um, this inferiority complex, so to speak, for a number of years. And it's really only recently that BU has been able to identify and establish themselves as, as a highly selective um, first-rate institution in many regards. Yeah, I remember when I was a teenager, and and Boston itself was a very, it was a, it was a, it was sort of a magnet city for young people, very hip, very cheap, very affordable. Um, in some ways, it was economically depressed, but still, it was a great place for young people to come. Boston University had a reputation as being sort of the safety school, and and and, and being the one that if you want to go to Boston and you didn't get into someplace else you would have preferred to have gone, you then went to Boston University. And, 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 I, and I think that, that was its reputation maybe through the late 60s, early 70s. And I think that's right. It, okay, and then what happened? Well, you know, I think it's funny, you mentioned that. I, I was thinking about the 1940s as well. There, Maurice Tolbin, who we named a bridge after in Boston, was, was the mayor of Boston at the time. And he was speaking at a BU event. And I remember he said that BU was a, a, a school for poor boys and poor girls. And you're right, it was it's the safety school. If students weren't going to Harvard, uh, perhaps if they weren't going to Tufts, then they would be going to say Boston University or Northeastern, um, or in some instances, Boston College. And it maintained that reputation probably until the presidency of John Silver. Um, he came to the university in 1971. And I think there's, there's these wonderful, colorful reports of his, his presidential interviews as he was interviewing for the position with the Board of Trustees where he would dismiss and criticize Boston University left and right as being one of the ugliest campuses <laughs> in the nation <laughs> at the time. Um, and that if he came, he, he, he would do everything he can to, to build and change its reputation. And over the course of his tenure, he really did in many ways. And you can, you can look at data point after data point after data point, where after the 30 plus years of, of John Silber's presidency, Boston University's reputation changed substantially. And then future presidents, uh, President Wessling and now uh, President Brown have really been able to capitalize that in a way that the original history of Boston University just did, was not able to take advantage of. Yeah. And I think Boston University is a great example where it's hard to separate the school from the city because, because the, the city itself has thrived so much in the last 30, 40 years. Is that because of Boston University and, and schools like BU and Northeastern and others improving their national image and international image? Or, or did they benefit by the fact that Boston itself was improving? So right. it's, it's hard to know who to give credit to in that regard, but, yeah. but the two sort of worked in a, in a synergistic way. No, there's no doubt. And, and certainly the fact that BU is literally on the green line um, after being a commuter, commuter campus for so many years in its early history, it, it, made, it made a big difference to it as well. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. So, um, um, so, so getting back to your career, and, and, and I want to tie this to what's going on now in, in, the, in, a, in a more contemporary sense. How, why did you make this shift from student life, student affairs, to academic uh, administration? Uh, how did that occur? And, 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 and what has that meant for you? Because I, I didn't introduce you by your title now. So, so, so why, why don't you tell us what you do now? Oh, sure. Right now, I, I am currently the Assistant Dean for Curriculum and Enrollment Services at the College of Arts and Sciences. Mm. I'm about to 
hopefully finish up my fifth year um, in that position. Um, you know, and, and I guess, you know, how I got to that is for, for a number of years now, I've always felt like I've had one foot in the student affairs world mm. and one foot in the academic affairs world. And I think that's for a number of reasons. But one, you know, I, I'm a person who's, who's really motivated and inspired intellectually. Mm. Um, I, I've, I've always felt comfortable with research and scholarship um, from, from even the time of being in college. Um, I would have opportunities to, to work as a teaching assistant for certain professors, and I loved being in the classroom. I loved the drama of the classroom, right. and I loved the ability of particular teachers to just make a classroom come alive, and it brings students to certain aha moments along the way. So I always felt very comfortable with that, and I always wanted to try to, to recreate those experiences in my own professional career. Mm. But it's because I sidestepped into the student affairs world, um, and at least initially, unbeknownst to me, sidestepped into it a way that I didn't realize how much it had to offer in terms of the educational um, contributions to, to students in their time here. Um, that I spent the first 15 years of my life in that world, but always was trying to put another foot in that academic affairs world. So whether it was working very closely with the faculty and residents who I saw as colleagues, Mm -hmm. uh, whether it was working on a doctorate and eventually a, a dissertation and teaching at the same time. Yeah. Um, I always felt like I was a, being a, doing a bit of both. Mm -hmm. And I think it actually developed into this realization that one has to develop proficiencies in both worlds, almost as if you're developing the ability to speak a new language. Yeah. And when I was in the student affairs world, I worked really hard to be able to speak faculty, right. um, so to speak. And so um, I, you know, I, I felt that I, I was- It is a separate language. That's it is a separate language. And, and there's, <laughs> there's, there's separate recruitments and pipelines and there's, there's, there's separate yeah. cultures in both worlds. And I felt like I was often trying to tell my student affairs colleagues right. um, what a faculty member meant when they were saying this or saying that or doing this or doing that. And I often felt when I was working with my faculty colleagues uh, that I needed to explain what student affairs was trying to do and why they were moving this way and emphasizing this or prioritizing that. Um, so that really has been kind of a, a, a defining narrative of my career to date. Um, and so when an opportunity arose about five years ago to interview for this position at the College of Arts and Sciences, it was much more of a seamless um, transition than, than I initially perhaps would have thought. There was certainly a learning curve, um, yeah. but it, it, it did bring me back in some ways into a more explicit uh, um, world where I was focusing on the academic work day in and day out. Yeah, interesting. Well, and, and a point you just made that I, I want to pick up on for a second. When we think about, you know, multiple cultures in academe, and it, you know, historically the most famous um, dichotomy is between si the sciences and, and the humanities and this, the so-called two cultures. But in some ways, student affairs and academic affairs are two cultures. And, and never the twain shall meet perhaps. But, but obviously, uh, like you tried to find common ground between the two, and or, or at least the ability to translate one to the other, which is probably a, a major accomplishment unto itself. Yeah, that's right. And th there's a big history behind all this as well. I mean, um, the, 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 the non-faculty administrators of, of today's world, um, they, they transitioned out of faculty positions at the turn of the 20th century as well. Yeah. And so, um, and, and it was be mainly because of the broadening of the mission of higher education, the broadening of the demographics and the student populations that were yeah. then being able to populate institutions. There needed to be separate human beings on a college campus that were tending to student life so that faculty could focus on a new focus, and that was research. Right. And that evolved over the course of 30, 40 years or so at the turn of the 20th century. But um, th there was that original historical uh, foundation there, and there, there there, there's a lot more, there's many similarities, but there's also many reasons for the structural differences. Okay. Now tell us more about, about your current job. What do you do? Hey, like how do you spend your day? <laughs> and you spend it on Zoom these days, I'm sure, but, but we still. Do. Yeah, so you know, in, in, a, in a normal semester, um, I'm responsible for what seems like a hodgepodge of behind the scenes academic uh, endeavors. So uh, I think one of the larger ones that I'm responsible for as of late is doing everything I possibly can to work on the operational side to implement a brand new general education curriculum. So uh, a number of years ago, Boston University um, voted to start its very first university-wide general education program. It used to be um, kind of isolated where each individual school or college had their own version of general education. Right. 
And so the university voted and a task force met to establish this implementation. I've been very involved with the implementation of that curriculum, um, which involves in many ways faculty um, considering what are the specific learning outcomes for this new general education, crafting a course with those learning outcomes in mind, and submitting it for being considered, considered as part of this new curriculum. And that's been a multi-year plan and right. a multi-year plan in terms of communication back and forth between uh, the various operational sides of the university, the registrar's office, the provost office, and um, the, the faculty in the various departments and programs to get that curriculum up to where it needs to be so that students can actually take those yeah. courses and learn in the classroom. Um, in addition to that, uh, the, just the nuts and bolts of establishing a standard schedule, a master schedule that, that classes must abide by where they start at a given time and they end at a given time, and they're, they're put on this systematic schedule in such a way that they mitigate conflicts so that students can actually take the classes that they want to take in order to make progress towards their degree. Yes. And, and mitigate conflicts so that um, faculty can, can teach in a way that's, that's the most efficient possible and students can graduate in the most efficient way possible. So kind of tending to that schedule and really helping the departments and programs um, put their courses in a way that attends to that schedule is, is a prominent role with what I do. Specifically for the general education program or beyond that as well? All, all courses offered by the College of Arts and Sciences. Oh, okay. So that's both general education, major and minor as well. Okay. So backing up a second to the general education, um, you work within the College of Arts and Sciences, but you work, you work with a university-wide program. So does that mean that the College of Arts and Sciences, in a sense, is the you know, sort of chief operating officer for the general education program? Well, and there, there is a, a separate office known as the, the hub office, which that would probably be kind of the chief um, operating center in terms of a functional area for, for the general education. But th as a result, they must partner with each school and college across the university in order to get things done. It just so happens, though, that the College of Arts and Sciences, by nature of its, of its pedagogy and by nature of its content specialization, they foot about 70 to 75% of the courses for the general education program. Okay. And because of the sheer scale of involvement of the college, um, you know, they're often involved in the lion's share of operational decisions as well. Okay, okay. So now bringing it up to the present, the present tense, and what's and and it's a very it's a very tension filled tense right now. I think. Um, so what what is going on, and 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 what can you tell us about? Uh, so it's now the beginning of May. We have, we have we 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 know what the summer is going to be like in higher education. It's going to be a remote summer for virtually every university. We know that Boston itself and Massachusetts, in particular, are hot spots for the the pandemic. And so, what is what is the process for you know for looking into the crystal ball and figuring out what the fall is going to bring, and how can we plan every possible contingency to deal with it? Right. Well, that's what it feels like. It feels like a crystal ball where, yeah. where it, it almost feels on certain days that um, anybody's guess is just as good as another person's practically. Okay. And, you, and you see that even on the public, uh, public health briefings that you yeah. see in both local, regional and national government. It's, yeah. um, you know, this is a moving target. And in my 20 plus years of working professional in higher education, it has created perhaps the most difficult um, decisions in the most difficult context for making decisions that I've ever experienced. Yeah. Um, and because it's a moving target, it, it really is hard to pin down. So I think what, what I and my colleagues are, appear to be doing in various working groups at this point in time is, is really trying to come up with a range of feasible scenarios or a range of feasible options that the university can, can consider when thinking about opening up for the fall. And it may mean that um, we're, we're articulating a, a prominent view of going with a, a, a plan A, but also at the same time communicating the importance of having a plan B in our back pocket at the exact same time. So that right. we're nimble and flexible so that if there is a rise in cases or infections in the fall, um, that we can respond appropriately and nimbly in a way that still preserves the educational outcomes that we're trying to work with in our students. Um, and at the same time, it also requires us to have open lines of communication across the entire university and with a wide variety of disciplinary specializations and areas so that we understand what the pinch points are um, for, certain, for certain disciplines across, across the college and across the university as they think about how to offer courses in the fall semester, whether they be remote, fully remote, as we are doing right now, or whether they be some type of hybrid 
uh, simultaneous residential and remote learning, or whether they be face-to-face -face classes. Um, and it's really trying to understand what will be easy to, to, to change over and to operationalize, and really what will be the difficulties and the challenges. As you said before, of course, it's that, that the experience of being a college student is more than simply the, what goes on in the, in, the, in the physical or virtual classroom, but it's a whole experience. And it so experience. anticipating what that's going to be it makes, is even more of a crystal ball, I think. Right. And so at what point do you think the, the, the current and prospective student needs to know what Boston University has in mind in order to make an informed decision as to whether to, to accept the invitation? That's a good question. You know, I think everybody wishes they knew yesterday um, so that they could plan ahead. I think, um, you know, it's students want to have a sense of certainty and so that they can plan accordingly for the fall semester. Faculty want to have the exact same sense so that they can build accordingly and plan um, for the fall semester. Um, we literally just ended a cycle where we were accepting enrollment deposits um, based on our, our, our April admissions open house period and yeah. the recent in, in admittance offers that we offered as a university. And other colleges and universities across the nation are probably in very similar cycles. And usually at this point in a normal term, we would be simply gauging or watching something called MELT over the course of the summer. So based on all those students who, who accepted our offer to, to come to Boston University and, and put down a deposit, you know, you know, what percentage of them actually melt away and go to different institutions or um, don't go into an institution altogether. So we're watching that over the summer just like we normally do, but we're also trying to work very closely with public health agencies and all the guidance that's coming out both locally and regionally. And we're also trying to, to watch our own um, numbers to try to figure out what's appropriate. Yeah. And because it's a moving target, it's really hard for us to pin down an answer right here, right today. It, it may not be until the middle of the summer where we have enough information to truly make an informed decision. Um, and that could change even as you get closer to the fall semester. You think back to the, the, the flu pandemic of 1918, for instance, right. where they initially thought they were gonna open up late, but they had to push that back not once, not twice, but three times, and they really didn't open up until late October. Oh, really? They, they, they had to work on an abbreviated nine-week term back in 1918 because of that. Yeah, but in those days, of course, Boston University was a local university. It was a local um, commuter school, yeah. Yeah, I mean, now it requires people to move from one part of the country and perhaps from another country altogether where the yeah. borders are, are, are still closed mm -hmm. um, to live on campus or off campus to sign um, um, agreements to, to, for, for apartments. Um, it, it involves how students are going to eat, wh um, where they're going to live, what clubs they're going to belong to, what right. sports they're going to participate in, whether people can actually watch sports anymore. That's right. um, it's, it's, so there are a lot of decisions going into this, I assume. There's and, a lot. And, and forecasting each one of those things is, you know, is, as you say, impossible to do, but you need contingencies. That's right. So I think, I think having a, a kind of a depth of contingencies is going to be very important because we just don't know what the social distancing parameters will be come the yeah. fall and how those will shift. Uh, we don't know if it's going to be this encouragement to have to reduce crowd sizes by a factor of two, by a factor of four. We, we just don't know yet. So it, it really is about having this range of feasible plans and feasible options um, to consider and trying to get faculty and students at least an inkling of what that range will be like as soon as humanly possible so that they can plan accordingly. Yeah, yeah. Any forecasts? You know, I still think it's too early. And I, I, th I think we'll probably be in a position um, to have some semblance of a range of options by mid to late April. So say, you know, by Memorial Day, for instance, that we could perhaps share with with uh, faculty that are wanting their very best to prepare accordingly over the summer months. And for, st for students who are trying to think about travel arrangements and that sort of thing. But at the same time, trying to provide updates on that plan throughout the course of the summer as well. Right, right. So right. We'll see, we'll see. Yeah. I think, I think yeah. there's a, it's, it's, it's a big question mark and a big, big moving target. Yeah, and even if the summer melt is worse than, than, than in previous years, that doesn't necessarily mean we've lost those students permanently. They may decide to go local for a while and then transfer to Boston University later on. So That's true. it's, so there, any numbers, I mean, as I've realized a while ago, this is really up to students in the end. Uh, the university should do everything possible to make things as smooth and accommodating as possible. In the end, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a major life decision that thousands of people are gonna make. 
Um, it is. For, it's on, on, behalf, you know, for, on behalf of Boston University, we have no control over that outcome. It is. And I think one thing, we, we really want to pay particularly close attention to our first year students. Yeah. Um, you know, m many of these students traditionally are students that have never lived away from home to begin with. And for them to be thrown in this context makes it all the more, more challenging. But we want to make sure that uh, we're paying particularly close attention to them so that, uh, you know, they'll, they'll want to have a robust and wonderful experience at BU and then want to come back for their sophomore year yeah. at the same yeah. time. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's, yeah. it's very important. And I think certainly in this, what happened in the spring was, was dramatic and, and abrupt and decisive in many respects. And students were by and large very understanding of what, what everyone went through. And, and in the fall, I'm sure they'll be very impressed with the effort to try to do this right, knowing that we don't have control over all the decisions. Um, like we can't you know, open up Boston uh, any more so than, than this governor will allow us to. And we can't decide that the planes are gonna run and that you know, it, 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 there, there are a whole number of things that um, are involved. And, um, and so it's going to be a matter of us being reactive, I think, and deferential to those decisions. That's right. It, it, it's an existential crisis, but we're not alone. Um, every every right. college and university across the nation is dealing with the exact same thing, yeah. some more acutely than others for a number yeah. of reasons. Um, and, and, and even other organizations, businesses, um, and other agencies are dealing exactly with what we're dealing with. It's, it, it's, a, it's a big, exactly. big challenge. And, and you say existential crisis. I would, I think, uh, argue that it's not existential crisis for higher education because higher education is going to continue to survive and thrive because that's that's a that's that's almost like consuming food in a sense. Um, it, it 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 plays a, a stable role in our society. The question is really the existential survival of individual schools that's and it. and 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 in the form that they are because there could be a massive redistribution that mm -hmm. could occur. Um, instead of choosing one school, uh, students may choose another because of any number of factors: cost, um, uh, which which state it's in, and, um, and 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 what and what's the the uh, in infection rate of that state. Um, it, it, a whole series of factors beyond the, the control of individual schools. So, um, uh, it, so speaking to current students now, what do you see as sort of the the opportunities, the threats, the, the thoughts that they should have as far as their career as an academic administration. Um, are we entering a, an exciting time in which there'll be a comparable number of jobs, but just maybe not in the places that you thought you'd be working? Or you know, is, is it much more dangerous and unsettling than that? Hmm. Um, in other words, are, are, we, are, we, are, are we engaged in a, in a really risky period in which people should be very careful about their life decisions, or should they embrace this as an opportunity to be part of a, you know, an incredible roller coaster ride? Perhaps a bit of both. I, you know, I think in some ways it's like trying to to uh, provide advice on on how to invest in the stock market at this point in time right. as well, right? It's literally. It's, it's you true, know, I yeah. think you know, in some ways, the advice that I give um, some of our students in the program these days are, are to be more conservative during this this period of time. But at the same time, to look at, have a bit of a long-term view where you're keeping your eye on the horizon. As you said, higher education as this kind of, this larger system has survived large-scale calamities in the past, including yeah. the Great Depression, which really is the yardstick by which we're trying to measure even, even today's crisis. Yeah. And um, yes, there were, there were a number of institutions that, that closed at that point in time. There will be a number of institutions out of the 4,000 institutions of higher education today that will, that will close and that will really be um, subject to, to the, the, the effects of this, this calamity. But there's, this is also an opportunity, particularly for budding higher education administrators, to pay very close attention to what institutions are doing. Um, and to really take note if, if, if they can kind of keep their head up and, and, and keep their eye on, on the horizon and, and make sure that they're, they're reading things like the Chronicle and they're looking broadly beyond Boston University and other schools and colleges that they're involved with so that they can get a sense for what institutions are doing and how they're trying to weather this storm. Right. It is a truly educational opportunity for them in and of right. itself as well. Um, and I think that it's, it's in that sense that uh, the, the students in this program that are really trying to take note, and one day they will be able to look back and say, I was there, right. this is what we did, this is what we shouldn't have done, this is what we should have done, but at the same time, I was there, we survived it, and this is in many cases a credit to this X, Y, and Z as yeah. to why we were able to, to, yeah. to overcome. 
I agree. I agree that I think it's it's a chance to be a participant in some very exciting times, even if they are a little bit unsettling and uh, uncertain as far as stability. Right. Daryl, thanks very much. I, I know you have to get back to uh, <laughs> to your <laughs> crisis sure. management at Boston University, and um, good good luck with that. And thank you for your time, and and I, I really appreciate it. My pleasure, Jay. Thank you so much, and take care.